Kitos, uh, and Moi, Nimeni on Alvaro, and that's all my Finnish, and oh, Swami. And yeah, this talk is called Metaphors We Compute By. And just to give a quick note, all sound, that Twitter handle is there because when I had a band back in Uruguay, everybody was making fun of us that we, we used to sound like Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, and old bands. So I say, yeah, we have this old sound, but we are still playing or whatever. <laughs> anyway, a bit of history. Anyway, so metaphors we compute by. I am really happy that they got this talk because whatever I send it, people say like, dude, you're on the wrong conference. <laughs> so yeah, the year is 1980. And there is a book published by George uh, Lakoff and Mark Johnson. The book is called Metaphors We Live By. After that book, you will find metaphors we eat by, metaphors we drive by, metaphors we I don't care what by. So I, my title is really original, as you can see. The main idea of the book is that metaphor isn't just a matter of uh, poetry and rhetorical flu uh, flourish. Like, not until the 80s, because in the 30s already, some philosophers of, of rhetoric started discussing what's the actual use of metaphor besides on literature. So this is not really a new idea. But what uh, Lakoff and Johnson said, they are cognitive scientists and, and linguists and so on, is that metaphors dictate how we think, how we behave, how we perceive, how the conceptual system is built. And the problem is, it's really hard to study the mind, because you cannot get like, into a brain and look at it. So they found a proxy. That proxy is uh, language. With language, we express our ideas and how we understand the world. So they decided to understand language to try to understand the, the mind. So they have a, like a first example that says that argument uh, is war. And because we understand argument with the war metaphor, this means we say things like, uh, your claims are indefensible. He attacked every weak point in my argument. I demolished his argument. I never won an argument with him. His criticisms were right on target, and so on. So the idea is because we understood argument as war, we came up with all these metaphors to talk about argument, and that makes us, like, we see the other person as an opponent, and we want to literally destroy them when we start arguing with them. We don't want to, let's say, cooperate. And they ask, what will happen if the argument is dance, for example, that you need to coordinate steps and, and be one with your partner until you reach a nice conclusion. I don't know. You can say, OK, I'm not convinced. So when people is not convinced, what we do? We talk about politics, right? <laughs> so <laughs> a friend sent me an article from the BBC that is called How Metaphors Shape uh, Women's Lives. And inside, they mention this experiment that says, consider an experiment that explores how metaphors of crime can affect people's decision making. Somewhere, some researchers on the Stanford University ask students to read one or two crime reports. One describes crime as a wild beast preying on the city, and the other as a virus infecting the city. The solutions that the students presented to reduce crime were fascinating. 75% of the beast students thought jail or punishment will resolve crime, and 25% suggested social reforms. And the plague neighborhood students, they, they opted for more like social reform, enforcement, and whatnot. So you can see, you read a, a, the, about a crime report based on beasts or plagues, and what you, how you try to solve the problem will be different. And the funny thing is that these students, they all claim, like, no, the facts is what made me change, and the numbers and the statistics. Both have the same numbers and the same statistics, but they came up with different things. But I can probably see that you're still not convinced. So let's talk about feminism confront technology. This is a very interesting book from 1991, if I'm not mistaken. 
And they talk at some point about language. And basically, like how everything that is hard is really macho and something that we should do because we are the cool kids. And everything that is soft, we don't care, like writing good documentation. Because who cares about this soft skill of writing? I'm a coder, I'm a hacker, my screen is black, right? Very dark. Um, I high five every time I, I, I solve a, a bug. And they say, yeah, similarly, the complementary values of hard and soft are also used to legitimate female, female exclusion from the world of engineering. Masculinity is expressed both in terms of muscular physical strength and aggression and in terms of analytical power. And you can read the whole thing, but things is researchers have been studying language and its relation to technology since at least the 80s. And this research at Coburn, she found a lot of things like everything was fine, but then the boys came to, into the playground and said, no, a computer belongs to me. You go back to being, I don't know, typing documentation, because we are the cool kids again. I'm still not convinced. OK, so human resource management. Who likes here to be called a resource? Something that you can be changed and move around. But that's how managers think of programmers. We are just simple resources that we can uh, be moved around and replaced. Not, no, it's not. People, we are not resources. So if you like to think about us as resources, then you have all this whole branch of HR that better be left outside the door, like what happened uh, at Uber with um, Susan Fowler. HR was basically ranting for, for management. So there you have it. And finally, trigger warning, giving a platform to racists. There is a conference, which I'm not going to name, but you probably will guess which one it is, that has a problem with uh, inclusion in, in tech. And they wrote a blog post trying to explain why they allow Nazis to speak at their conferences. And it says wrestling with inclusion at whatever the config is. If you are wrestling, you really need to wrestle with inclusion, or you maybe want to get together, talk, integrate, and so on. So metaphors are everywhere. But we came here to talk about computers, right? <laughs> computers, if you have seen this film, or maybe not, there's a book as well were the name given to the people that did calculations for engineers. They were called computers. And because we didn't have a, any word for this new machine that could do calculations pretty fast, we just called them uh, mechanical computers or automatic computers. I don't remember what was the word back in the 40s, 50s. But again, our whole industry is based out of a metaphor from people that did computation by hand back in the day. Because uh, the cool thing about metaphors is that they enable understanding. And the previous speaker just said that when he start, st started, DevOps is transportation. He just said that, right? Did you know that be besides this is like the most basic uh, example of a metaphor, blah, blah is blah, blah. That's how metaphors work in literature and so on. But curiously, Metaphor in Greek means to transfer or transportation, actually. That's in, in Greek, you, you can find many tracks that say metaphor in Greek, but they're actually shipping stuff around. <laughs> they are not really selling you metaphors, let's say. But back to the talk. The basic metaphor is like what Shakespeare says, Juliet is uh, like the sun. And because the metaphors uh, help us to understand concept, you understand that the life of Romeo uh, is always orbiting around uh, Juliet. He cannot live, let's say, without uh, her light. And I don't know all the things that you can understand when Shakespeare shall say Juliet is like the sun or Romeo. But metaphors are not a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, concepts because I'm pretty sure you didn't make this association. <laughs> and that's the point. Like metaphors, they will do a mapping between one part of the mind into another, so you kind of get the idea, but you won't find a one-to-one -one thing. And that's not how they work, and that's not the point. That can bring problems later, as I will uh, show. Then there is a really cool book which is called The Geometry of Meaning, Semantics Based on Conceptual Spaces. 
wow. Basically, this guy took uh, topology and tried to explain language. And he says, like, metaphorical map mappings preserve the cognitive topology of the source domain in a way consistent with the inherent structure of the target domain. Metaphors transfer information uh, from one conceptual domain to another. And here's what I'm saying. What is transferred is a pattern rather than a domain-specific information. So the metaphor can be used to identify a structure in a domain and that, that would not have been discovered otherwise. So we use metaphors to say, OK, I don't really know how, what is DevOps, but I can tell you it's transportation. And then you start saying, OK, this is how transportation works, so maybe this is how DevOps works. That's the, the idea. And for me, it's like uh, our brains are really good at doing this graph isomorphism problem. Like we have this structure in one way, and we manage to map it to a structure in a different uh, domain, let's say. And this is from the Quanta magazine. I'm not really good at animation, so. <laughs> and by this mapping of things is how metaphors create uh, new knowledge. But metaphors also obscure understanding. And that's the problem with the telegraph. What's the problem with the telegraph? Telegraph means uh, far writing, something like that. So the original telegraph, people really try to do far writing, like something that will type things, or, or, but not really. They didn't understand that you could encode stuff in Morse code, send it over the wire, and decode it on the other side into language. The f when we started doing Braille, there people saw, OK, maybe language doesn't really have to be written as it is, and then came Morse code. But at the original Telegraph, people went to say, can you send this letter, this message, to my mom somewhere else? And the message stayed in the table, and the guy typed there on the Telegraph. And the person was like, hey, dude, I tell you, send my message. Because people didn't catch that this whole thing was a metaphor. So they were worried, like, why this paper is still on the table? And for us, that sounds like really, like, dude, like, what? But that's happened with people back in the day. Like uh, Darwin, when he went to Uruguay back in the 1830-something, uh, people thought that he was like a kind of a wizard. Not really a wizard, because, yeah? But he was in a countryside village. And he said, so Montevideo is that way, and Brazil is that way. I say, how do you do? And uh, Darwin was with the, um, what is this thing that points north? The compass. He was with the compass there, just knowing what are the direction, and he had a map. So sometimes people don't understand how technology allows you to be more powerful, let's say. And this is about tools. Sometimes our tools do what we tell them to, other times we adapt ourselves to our tool requirements. And in, in language and in thought, metaphors are the tools. So the same way that metaphors allow us to understand things, they also obscure understanding or, or limit understanding. So when we go to code, which is probably what you want to hear about, there is a very interesting paper that is probably the best unknown paper. It's called What a Programmer Does. The main idea of this paper is that we write programs for other people to read, like the, um, the talk that we had earlier about documentation. And this person says, to program is to write to another programmer about our solution to a problem. That's what we are trying to say. I had this problem, I solved it, this is how I did it. The easiest that thing is to understand, the better we manage to convey our solution. And in a very weird way, he managed to build this sentence. No one has seen a program which the machine could not comprehend, but which humans did. Translated, if your program is syntactically valid, a computer will manage to parse it, compile it, and run it. That's not the point. The computer is a nice tool to execute algorithms fast, thanks. But we are humans writing for humans, either us in the future, our colleagues, or open source people on, on GitHub, let's say. But it's always a human en endeavor. And that's why I think the way we write should be easy to understand for uh, other people. And we come to types. Types are the characters that they tell the story 
in our programs. But I'm not talking types in the Haskell sense, more in the Barbara Liskov sense. She, had, she actually had to fight back in the 70s to tell people that you do, should do structured programming and uh, program with types. So all these types, without them, we just have operation on, on stream of bytes. And then you say, OK, but why this is so important? Let's talk, let's say, about choosing the right data structure. If you have a bunch of users, you can store them in an array, in a set, in a linked list, queue, stack, I don't know. But when you store them in a set, you are telling me that they have to be unique. So that set metaphor could be just a bunch of bytes, could be an, uh, an array, as in C. But the set is telling me those users have to be unique. So we can see that the program explanatory power is a measure of their own elegance. How easy do you convey your solution is, is there in, in, in those metaphors that you use. Data structures have explanatory power. That they allow us to do uh, cognitive leaps. Like if we talk about task scheduling and I avoid saying the word queue, it will be really hard. But when I understand that I'm having a queue in th uh, theory problem, the whole mathematic of queue in theory comes available. The same with route planning. It could be really hard until you understand it's a graph theory problem. The right metaphor for that problem is graph theory, all the mathematics for free. And in database replication, back in the 80s, they tried to do replication with rumor mongering or spreading rumors, let's say, gossip, as it's called uh, today. But they couldn't get the mathematics right until they understood it was actually epidemics. When they got the right metaphor, which is epidemics, they have the whole mathematic of a theory of epidemics for free. So is everything a metaphor? You probably don't believe me. Just check this slide about distributed system. Whenever nodes need to agree on a common value, we start a consensus algorithm to decide on a value. There's usually a leader process that takes care of making the final decision based on the vote received from its peers. And I can keep going. I don't have the time, but you can see the, the slides online. But how we talk about computers is full of uh, metaphors. To finish. Buzzwords. Containers, right? Containers, they give us a really great metaphor to sell something on an elevator pitch, let's say. And I think that's one of the biggest power of containers. Like, it's really easy to talk about them. They, we understand they are standard. They can be shipped anywhere in train, ships, trucks. They are stakeable. They are reusable. We also understand that we are not waiting to, to fill a whole ship of containers before we can ship the, the package. OK, we understand that that part of the metaphor doesn't make sense. But thanks to the containers metaphor, we have this everywhere. But why didn't the Uber jars or the Erlang uh, releases never catch up? Because they don't have a nice thing that I can talk about. Also, there is also a wreckage recovery thing. Maybe that's the next startup. When containers start uh, failing up, we need to recover them. The same can be said about uh, microservices. I don't have time to, to go through this, but if you look at the whole metaphors using around uh, microservices, you will ask yourself, Erlang anyway? Anyone, sorry? And they say this at the, f at the end of the paper. The problem is, why El what is the Erlang elevator pitch? I will never manage to sell somebody with like uh, actors, and I don't care. Cool story, bro. I mean, I was an Erlang programmer for six years, but thanks, please, please find something else to tell me about, right? Because we need nice uh, metaphors to explain, to sell, and so on. Finally, to finish, meta uh, we need to master the art of metaphor selection. We need to get people to understand things and then explain how the things actually work. Is RabbitMQ a job server or not? It's not really a job server. It does more things, but at least you understand it's a job server. Then we go to the next step. Master the art of uh, meaning amplification. And we understand that our program is a metaphor for the solution we found. If this can amplify the understanding of somebody else, then I think we did a good job on this program that the, we brought. Those are the references, credit for the images, and Kitos.
All right. Thank you, Alvaro. Thanks. So, any questions for Alvaro? I have a hard time seeing any hands. People is leaving the room. All yeah, right. there. <laughs> Mika is about to come with the mic. Thanks for the talk. Uh, you mentioned a couple of metaphors that are quite, uh, well, they go back to ancient times, actually, like you mentioned a gossip protocol or uh, an election process or something like that. And uh, the, uh, the process of writing programs hasn't really changed in a, like, significantly since we actually started doing that. I mean, we have more tools and tools are more complicated but the process is the same. And uh, do you have like, any thoughts on how the, uh, how the process of writing code and the metaphors uh, that we use when we think about writing code could change in like uh, coming years or in the future or something like that? So there is a paper by Peter Naur, the Danish uh, computer scientist called Programming as theory building, and he wrote this in back in the 80s. Then Flores, another philosopher programmer, wrote about these things. And I don't want to see the, say the D word, but in a way, the DDD people are talking about that, and, and I need to mouthwash myself. Sorry. I don't want to get into that thing because my problem with metaphors and, and buzzwords. When the metaphors start dying, then for you it's just like, I don't care. And this is DDD for my point of view. It's really cool in one way, in another way it's like putting me away because it sounds like I will go sell marketing things. But this paper by now kind of explains this thing when you need to find the right metaphor for your system and use this to build your documentation, to build the language you speak with, with the person that wants the thing built, the product owner or whatever, versus the developers and, and, and build together this common language. I think improving communication is what matters. The final solution in code is really co cool for the hacker geek, I don't know, but does it really solve the problem? Does it make the world a really a better place? And so, and so, and so. And this only can be achieved, I think, with language. I think that paper, Programming a theory building is a good uh, start to that. Yeah. Excellent answer. Others? I can't see any hands. There's one to the left from me. Um, okay, so actually this is very, very interesting, and it actually convinced me. <laughs> so I was thinking, like, is there any example that you can think of now, like, where we used some metaphor in the past and it was really wrong, or, like, it was changed and now, like, uh, communication improved for something in our field in computer science? Well, out of the blue, I don't know. I... It's just like um, it was curiosity more than any other thing because actually um, oh. I see I see the point. It convinced me completely. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking if there was in our history some kind of metaphor we used and it was wrong. I mean, depend what you mean by wrong. But uh, something that has been changing a lot in the database industry is the whole use of the master-slave uh, um, nomenclature. Yes. <laughs> people have a bad history with that, yeah. with slavery and whatnot, and some people want that to be changed, and I say, why not? So there you have one that is really wrong, I would say, mm -hmm. that is, is a change I welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, then in the case of Erlang, that I just went through it, the whole actor model, I'm not sure it's easy to understand. It's kind of get it, but I don't do the get into stage. I, mean, I don't know. That metaphor, I really like Erlang, <laughs> but I'm not sure if this is the right one to, to bring forward that concept. Yeah. And then in this book, uh, Feminism Confront Technology, you can go there and find all the 
wrong metaphors we have about being superhero, mega macho programmers that are going to conquer the world and destroy the evil bugs that try to, okay, yeah, yeah, chillax, man. You know, that's, it's, it's something that I think we should change. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you. That's Thanks. about it. <laughs> All of our.